today's episode of EU4, I will change the fate of the Aztecs. In 1518, a Spanish ship arrived on the shores of the Aztec Empire. A year later, a Spanish fleet led by Ferdinand Cortes arrived, tempted by the vision of the Aztec gold cities. Five years later, the Aztec Empire ceased to exist and its former territories came entirely under Spanish control. I will start my adventure with the Aztecs in 1444 and do everything I can to prevent their fall. I'll unite all the divided tribes into one powerful Aztec Empire, reform the religion, build a powerful army and economy and prepare for the arrival of the Spanish, Portuguese, English or French. Welcome Imperialist Lucas here. I I must admit that the new Aztec Empire is truly a bloody empire because we even have a new special mechanic. The more blood I shed from my enemies, the better bonuses my armies will receive. I can also spill the blood of my own citizens, but they might not like that. I really don't know why. Donating blood is supposedly necessary. Another important mechanic is, of course, the reform of my religion, which is pretty similar but also much easier to manage. The Aztec currently have a giant mission tree divided into several parts, with the last part being more relevant in the next episode. Yes, you read that right, colonization of Europe. Although I lied, because we have smallpox and everything associated with the arrival of Europeans, so maybe not. The Aztecs are definitely the most powerful military nation in the area. They have perfect national ideas for this, a rather warlike ruler, but the successor just had an accident. Unfortunately, the ruler is not a general at the start, unless you use the national decision to make Montezuma a really good general. So, you can decide whether you want him to die earlier or recruit other generals. Unfortunately, I didn't get a very good one. As for social classes, the Aztecs start with a strange privilege of a triple alliance, reflecting the fact that the Aztecs were a hegemon in the area, not an empire, which gives us bonuses for our vassals. The privileges I distribute here aren't entirely standard, as for example, cheaper advisors are missing. As the Aztecs, for the first few years, we want to avoid increased stability costs, because each reform will lower stability. By one or two points, I don't remember exactly. I also complete a mission for a cheaper military advisor, hire additional cheaper advisors, and raise a mercenary company. The wars begin almost immediately. Hiring all the advisors causes me to stop making money because our economy isn't great at this point, as my gold income is really low even though I have quite a bit of it around. This is because we are a primitive nation with an unreformed Nahuatl religion. Luckily, I got a slightly better commander from the states, unless you want Montezuma as your commander, who is really powerful. But I wouldn't want him to die too early. But as they say, no risk, no fun. On November 30th, I appoint my first rivals and look for countries with few allies. I don't really want allies. If you need them, I advise making alliances with countries as far away from you as possible, because you'll probably vassalize or conquer all the nearby ones. By raising the army, I can complete a mission that gives me 10 points of army tradition. I could have waited to recruit a general. <coughs> From this event, we learn about our ruler's beautiful dream of creating a powerful empire. It's good that we agree with this at the moment. I also receive the following powerful bonuses. In Mexico, I also launch a defensive edict, which will probably come in handy. On December 12th, I start my first major war with the Casas Belly Flower Wars because, thanks to it, I will be able to create Mesoamerican tributaries. I quickly smash the first armies of my opponents and send my diplomats to build a spy network so fortresses in the area will fall faster. I even managed to divide my opponent's troops, which I then defeated in battles. Boom, boom. Boom, I upgraded the temple to the third level. Then I started besieging Kolima and with the rest of my army I went to destroy smaller armies of my opponents. I was going to make Kolima my tributary right away, but it is currently involved in quite a few wars. So no, at least for now. But I do make the next country my vassal, humiliate them and capture a rather tough fortress to conquer. Most importantly, you need to quickly improve relations with vassals now so they remain loyal as negative relations lower loyalties significantly. After sacrificing thousands on the altars, I can finally perform the first ritual, which will reduce aggressive expansion and the costs of annexing new provinces. Making Kolima my tributary led to me having even more wars, but that's good because it gives me five vassals. After occupying and conquering Tlaxcala, I make this country my tributary. I could complete this mission, which intrigued me greatly because look, the requirement is that these provinces should not be my tributaries. Could it be just a regular vassal? Or perhaps it's another typical paradox glitch. After gaining five vassals, I can enact my first reform. But don't do it. Each reform will increase my doom level by 50 points. More importantly, it will also raise the liberty desire of my vassals by 40%. Moreover, there's a rule that any vassal with more than 50% liberty desire will break free. 
That's why we need to lower their independence desires as much as possible beforehand, which I almost managed to bring down to zero using various mechanics. I'll carry out the first reform and definitely opt for the religious reform that reduces stability costs, because stability will drop. And only now does the game inform me that I risk losing any vassal with more than 50% liberty desire. This time, I kept all my vassals and tributaries. After the first reform, I can complete a mission that grants me a cheaper advisor, which I immediately take advantage of. I also granted the strong duchess privilege because, to be honest, I forgot about it earlier. Then, I attack my only rival to humiliate him. These are his vassals, and they're all disloyal. Fighting battles is one of the best ways to lower the doom level. For every 1000 enemy units killed, we lose 1 doom point. I killed 11,000, but only lost 1 point? Something's off here. Ok, here's the list of what decreases doom, and oddly, winning battles and then occupying provinces are still listed here. I'll do a little show of strength to gain 100 points of each type, as I'll need a lot of them. During a brief period of peace, I started developing my provinces to complete this mission, though I honestly debated waiting until I reformed my religion. I must admit, I'm surprised at how quickly my vassal's discontent dropped after I enacted the reform. I also asked my tributaries for a small sacrifice to lower Doom's progress. This was a much more effective way to lower Doom than asking for the sacrifice of your vassal's ruler, as that would increase discontent among all your subjects. Thanks to this, I could carry out another reform, which almost cost me several vassals. Or not. I got lucky. In 1459, I began another series of wars because I had to get rid of Doom. However, I don't foresee any problems. And honestly, it's very strange because now, after a battle, I lost 12 Doom points. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Typical paradox. However, these wars were mostly about sieging because the enemy troops went to siege my tributaries' fortresses. From these countries, I mainly demanded sacrifices and payments. Thanks to sacrificing the Zapotec ruler, I was able to carry out another religious reform. This time, however, I lost most of my vassals. The best part was that I had no truce with them anyway, so I could attack them again. The only problem was that my relations with them were too good. I really don't know what that's based on. I killed 11,000 now and didn't recover a single point. Now, 3,000 and I lost points. I really don't know how it works now, though I think I'm starting to understand. It probably has to be victories on foreign territory. The worst part of these wars was that every time I wiped out an enemy army, someone else attacked them immediately. After establishing a significant number of vessels, I could complete the divide and conquer mission. At the moment, when I demanded the final sacrifice and had Doom reset, I could finally cheaply adopt all the technologies I was behind on. Yes, Doom increases the cost of implementing new technologies, though you don't see it here because I have zero, but I found a moment where I had more, and sure enough, there were technology and idea costs. I'll wait a bit before adopting the next technology level while my doom is at zero and rising very slowly. Occasionally, I took out cheaper 1% loans to pay off the 4% ones. Thanks to this, even though I was in debt, I wasn't actually paying anything for it. After advancing my technology, it was time for more reforms, actually, the last two. And once again, my vassals didn't break free. This is strange. But I asked my tributaries once more to sacrifice their rulers. I then started another war for humiliation to gain another 100 points of each type. I flexed my strength again, advanced my technology, although it's 8% more expensive. In 1470, I enacted the final reform and lost most of my vassal states, which isn't really a problem. Now it's time to continue down this mission path and unify the entire Mexican region. I think... I'm about to enter a big war where I'll conquer most of these states. Well, these provinces anyway. At this stage, a high doom level is actually quite beneficial because it reduces aggressive expansion by 62% or even more, since uh, my altars of blood are fully stocked. At this point, it's all about sieging. Luckily, I have two good commanders for this. I also began colonizing the first Aztec land to connect with a certain province. For the first age ability, I definitely choose reduced aggressive expansion, which will be helpful. One war, and I really conquered a lot. Before coring though, I'll complete this mission since it gives me territorial claims on this part and consolidates the development of uh, conquered provinces. I need to develop the capital to level 20, and then even 35. Where are all these rebels coming from? More keep arriving all the time. Now I'm focusing on administrative management because I'll need quite a few points to unite and conquer this entire region. A plague, but thankfully not the European one. Tough choice, reform or stability. I think I'm not gaining any reforms at this moment. Unfortunately, with further conquests, I'll have to wait until 1479. Literally every other country has a truce with me. After a while, I had even better warriors, the best in morale attack. Interestingly, I could annex those tributaries, but I didn't want to just yet. In 1481, 
one, unfortunately, my glorious ruler died and Moctezuma Tertu took his place. Meanwhile, I also developed the warrior culture. Nothing surprising as I had already won 62 battles and supposedly built a road network in my country. From what I can see, the next missions from this region will have to wait for the arrival of Europeans. This is a major mission for province development. And remember, as a primitive nation, we have a 50% increased cost for province development. Another war turned out to be quite large, but I practically conquered all the post-Aztec provinces. The enemies only have double the numbers, but fortunately they are far behind me in technology, as I already have the fifth technology. Hello, I've come to wipe you all out down to the last man. I've already conquered the first country in this war, it's going extremely well, but that's all thanks to my technological advantage. Even larger armies aren't a challenge, though they did inflict some losses. Then I struck at the Zapotec army and all their allies in the region. Oh, another Moctezuma. Yes, it's that time again. I'm taking multiple capitals at once because my enemies are retreating, probably across the border. I'll choose the colony bonus in the next era development. I'm setting them up anyway. I'm conquering the Zapotecs and with them gone, I've taken all their vassals. Yes, vassals, not tributaries. <coughs> Finally, my diplomats will be useful again. I managed to turn my enemies against each other and now two rebellions are fighting each other. I'll face the winner, a simple strategy. After these conquests, I can make the Huasteca culture accepted for free and create a new trade center here. Oh, what's this? This wasn't here before. Now I understand how this privilege works. I didn't get it before. Oops, after my conquests, all my vassals will be much more loyal. I see that the mission tree is heavily focused on Mesoamerican tributaries. Unfortunately, I only have one, but that's how it turned out. By the way, these tributaries work almost like regular vassals, so they're better for me. Extra points from tributaries would be very useful. I kept waging wars, and here I had to conquer the whole north as quickly as possible. Those distant countries are basically just conquests now. After these wars, I could even afford to build my first building, a temple in Mexico. In the meantime, I also advanced to the fifth administrative technology. This allowed me to choose the right idea for my country. And honestly, I'll go with the standard exploration idea. With it, I should more easily reach South America and the tribes in North America. Although I was seriously considering two alternative builds, administrative and influence ideas, or perhaps innovative and quality ideas. Let me know in the comments which ideas you usually choose when starting as the Aztecs. I saw in the last episode with the Czechs, where I asked you about this, that many people play similarly to me. And thanks to the Aztecs having cheaper ideas from the start, even though I haven't started a Golden Age yet, which might have been advisable, I immediately developed three levels of exploration ideas. So let's keep colonizing. The Spanish have also appeared as the first Europeans. Not good. So, I sped up my wars and started declaring war on more nations. But I have to admit, playing as the Aztecs is really fun now because they have those vassals. They field quite large armies that participate in the wars. My first conquests among the Mayans have just opened up a front there. Yes, I literally conquered the first three provinces. And thanks to this, my vassals will be even more loyal. I've never managed to reach the seventh military technology as the Aztecs without converting to animism. But I'll wait on that. I'm not in a hurry. I'll stockpile those points. I think I'll start the next war right after this one. Yes. Definitely. In these wars, the worst part is that I have to siege every level 3 fortress. It's very slow. A few years later, I finally broke through those fortresses. And to my misfortune, the reformation in Europe broke out very quickly at this point. I'm just wondering how I know about it. Never mind. I'm now building my first three ships, COGS. By 1506, I had basically brought all of Mexico under my control. It took a while, but honestly, I wasn't in a hurry because I wanted to farm a lot of monarchy points by attacking my rivals earlier. And now, I've started the process of integrating my vassals. I probably won't don't need them anymore. I also abdicated my ruler because I have a mission that will improve my current ruler's stats by two military points. It was rather worth doing, and I could finally complete the mission to unite my entire region. I regret that I couldn't do this as Montezuma the first, because a special event would have occurred. Honestly, if I had known it gave such bonuses to the Aztecs for the rest of the game, I would have hurried. My country's name has changed actually, it's now an empire, and now I'm in the most boring stage because I just have to wait for the Europeans to arrive. With the establishment of the new nation of Aztlan, I got a new option to settle uncolonized provinces. Unfortunately, I need 75 points of government reform progress for that, and right now, I have zero. The fate of the alliance. Honestly, if I had managed to conquer this whole area as Montezuma with that hidden modifier for stronger vassals, I would have kept the alliance because it would have been quite good. But I didn't manage it, so I'll get rid of that privilege. Economically, I'm focusing on lowering autonomy, anticipating and suppressing rebellions everywhere to reduce separatism in all my provinces as quickly as possible. I'll also be colonizing more provinces towards South America, leaving this part for the Europeans to colonize. I've expanded my capital into a literal city of gold. After plundering the entire area, Mexico now has 45 development points, an incredibly good province. I'm intrigued by this mission. 
Can it be exploited like a similar mission in the earlier Czech game? I don't see a limit here. I really regret not having more Mesoamerican tributaries. First, I noticed we got a special privilege that gives me extra military points from that tributary. Second, I can integrate this tributary regardless of their support for me. Just before the Reformation era, I started the Aztec Golden Age, although I'm not sure how useful it will be for me since there are still no colonizers in sight. Oh, I discovered new neighbors to the north, time to greet them Aztec style, and new friendships have been formed. Well, I found the Spaniards in Cuba and honestly will invade that Spanish colony right away. This leads to me completing the mission to push beyond the known, which strengthens my army a bit. Interestingly, the Spanish armies are worse than mine and I probably won't have any problems with them. I literally slaughtered all the newcomers, but mistakes were made. I forgot that the flower war requires me to capture the capital, which isn't here. <coughs> Luckily, I gained 11% by systematically destroying the landing armies on my territory, so I was able to take a few provinces from this Spanish colony. I just need to core these provinces so that in three years I can reform my religion through the Spanish. This allowed me to adopt all institutions and catch up significantly in technology, I think. First, I caught up in uh, diplomatic technology because with it I can now get a bonus for spying on colonies. And here the technology is at level 10, while I'm at level 7. Look, 7% 7 from the spy network. Eventually, I'll even be ahead in technology, which is amazing. For the next ideas for the Aztecs, I'm choosing religious and quantity. The best part is my nation has now recognized the value of gold, so I'm earning a lot. I can field 72,000 troops, which means I have no equal rivals in the area. Moreover, at this point, my armies are completely modernized, although they're not yet the best kind of troops I can have. There are some missions here for upgrading them. The best part is, I managed to convert my entire nation without any plagues breaking out. This is probably because I didn't have any Spanish, Portuguese, English or European colonies in the Mexico region, only in Cuba. Thanks to this, I can continue with the mission I was focused on, punishing all invaders. And I won't hide it, there are some interesting options here, like boosting missionary strength for the rest of the game or increasing manpower in provinces with Aztec culture. But more importantly, we can adopt the strongest unit type, High American, and honestly we'll use them to invade Europe. OMG, these units are so powerful. They're better than the Hussars. Just look at the Aztec infantry. Practically until the end of the game, European infantry doesn't stand a chance against the Aztec, or rather American infantry. It's a shame the Aztecs didn't get some sort of naval doctrine for invading Europe, unless there's something hidden here. In this episode of Victory 3, you can see how I create powerful Super Germany, which surprisingly isn't an easy task, because it involves a combination of three factors, economy, a powerful army, and diplomatic actions. 